democratic, but the voice, if you like, of the poor. And then the other point is, okay, it may be that in 20 or 30 or 40 years' time, the world doesn't produce enough to go around, so there is a technical need. But again, the technical solutions, exactly as you're saying, may exist, and one obvious potential one is genetic modification. Now, why is it that there is very little genetic modification planting in Africa? I would argue that the single most important reason is because Africa's export market is Europe, mm. and the EU bans the import of genetically modified goods. And if you decide to, grow, to plant genetically modified maize for domestic consumption, there is a fear, probably scientifically false, that that would affect the, the mange too that a Zambia is exporting to, to the UK, for example. And therefore, Zambia above all, precisely because Zambia really has a slice of, 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 the, of the UK um, market, Zambia banned food aid when they had a famine going on because it was genetically modified. And this is profoundly unhelpful. But I tried to, in the same international development policy, I said, you know, the Liberal Democrats should fund research in genetic modification of agriculture, and it got taken out before it got to the debate. The first time the Federal Policy Committee saw it, they went, nope, we're against it. And politics is the problem. Anybody else? Your light's on, Annabelle. Check my mentions. Oh, no. First, I, I would like to congratulate all speakers. Uh, your presentations were very interesting and uh, very inspiring. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say that the last couple of years, I've searched in uh, uh, the reports of the United Nations of the, and of the UNICEF, where I got the following information that about 15 million children uh, at the age, at the most, of 10 years old die because of hunger, because of lack of medicine, because the water they drink is filthy. So we have 15 million people that they die on our planet for the reasons that I just mentioned. That means that in three years, 45 million children die. Let's go back to the Second World War. About 50 million people died. And these 50 million people died were soldiers. We spent a lot of money for this war. Whereas, if we were to help these young children, these children, not to die because of hunger and so on. We, we won't take more from us, that is, uh, 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 tanks and aeroplanes, and we won't ask anybody to die for this. We will just ask for a few money, just to help these children not to die. I will recall, if you remember, the first picture, uh, the first speaker that showed to us, it was a dying children, and few feet away, there was a vulture waiting for the kid to die and go up and eat it. And we're standing here and doing almost nothing for this. Of course, after the Second World War, we all talked about, about, against the beast we called Hitler. And we, were, we were, were wondering why the Germans didn't go against him. Please excuse me for being impolite, but let's all think about this. Are we, are we, are we, or are we not in the same position of the Germans all over the planet where we see 15 million children die and we don't do very much, almost nothing about it. And I said again, to solve this problem, it does need to go and, and give my life or my children's life. It only need a few, a few dollars. I have come again to, uh, 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 to some other reports where they, Mr. Chairman, they estimate that 
if the 30 most, most, most rich people in the world give 4% of their, uh, of their uh, richness, or whatever the right word is, wealth, the case is all over. That's it. Let, let, let me finish a second. Or if we, put, if we take away, say, 0.111 from, the, from petroleum, or also 0.1111 from the stock market, that's all. As a matter of fact, it, it costs about $1 billion per year. But if you want to protect the, the environment, then it costs 150 billion years, uh, 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 dollars to, to save these people. So in closing, I will say that the rich people in the world, which is the Western world, which is 1 billion people, consume 60% of the production of the whole planet in energy, in food, and everything. And the rest of it, 40%, is left for the 6 billion people. But I would like to say again, what are we going to say to this father and mother that the ch his child is dying of hunger? And a vulture a few, a few feet away is waiting for the child to die, and this is what is going to happen. The vulture will go and eat it. I think that if we are going to give excuse to this father that, well, we don't know so well the ethics and we don't know exactly the law, so on which I respect, of course we have problems, but I think that they are all excuses. Forgive me for being impolite, but I think this father and, his, and the mother, this is what they'll do. they'll do. And if you, and this is, I finished, if you, if you take all these dead children in their coffins, and you put one next to the other, I think you, the, you, you, you will create a, state, a, a straight line that starts from North Africa and goes to London. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much. Um, uh, to be fair, I mean, I think David introduced it in very much the same spirit as you have, but you've, you've put it very eloquently. Annabel wishes to speak now, please. Can I just say, it seems to me that it's not just giving a few dollars. That's the problem. I think if it were just a matter of giving a few dollars, the truth is, since the Second World War, I imagine people have given regularly a few. We probably should give more. Perhaps we should tithe like the Mormons do. But that's not the only problem, because one of the problems, as we know, one of the main causes of famine is civil war. Part of the problem is we have governments who are corrupt, and even when they're not corrupt, they're overwhelmed. So if it were just a matter of giving a few dollars, I think we would have solved the problem. The problem is it's not just a matter of giving a few dollars. It's a problem of doing a great deal more. And it's there, I think, that actually, that is why it's so difficult and why I think pictures like this are misleading and actually quite sometimes counterproductive. Because on the one hand, the photo, is, the picture is so shocking. It's so frightening that it's hard not to be moved. But what it moves you to do is to give money to Oxfam and to give money to charity, and that's very good. But perhaps what we ought to be doing also is something completely different, maybe in addition giving money towards, I don't know, projects that help to stop civil war, but you know, it's not so easy. So I think, to be fair, it's not like David and the others weren't talking about this. It's not like people, or even the EU, on trying to do things. It's, a, it's not just simply a matter of giving a few dollars. Yeah, I, I did pick up on, on the sort of prioritization of, of spending, though, I think is an important point. And you were right about military spending as well. But I think this does go to, to then the conceptions of national interest by states. So it's interesting, a similar point was made a few years ago. We had a talk in our university from the British Development Minister. And he was asked... Um, by the, someone there doing development studies from Kenya. Um, and the point was made to him, well, what you spent on the war in Iraq, if you'd have spent that on development instead, what would you have achieved? And that question meant nothing to him because, oh, that's a national security issue. It doesn't come into, into our kind of uh, play here. But no, it's how you prioritize spending your money is important.
All right. Yes, please. Since we talked about Alexander the Great, huh, either as a colonialist or as a <laughs> warrior or as a peacemaker or whatever, the story is that when he was very young, somebody showed him a piece of rope tied in a very, very complex way. It was undoable. And they told him, Come on, undo it. And he looked at it, and then he took a sword, and shup, he eliminated the presence, the presence of the knob. And uh, for us, his disciples, this is a very interesting uh, example and lesson. And because we've talked about a huge confusion and a huge complexity, when we talk about ethics, morality, environmental, issues, climate, biotechnology, genetics, whatever. The question of many people, I happened to meet recently, and I was driven by a desire to get involved in peace through the promotion of Olympic spirit and Olympic truth. I have been privileged in meeting thinkers who think about peace. It's interesting that in the last two years, Worthy people of the world are clustering around one very simple universal toolkit for solving complex problems. And uh, this toolkit, we call it the universal values cluster. And these people, including myself and many growing, we believe that universal values beyond color, religion, politics, geographic location, whatever, which are indeed embedded in the proteins of the genes. And Sir John, if you can make a research on finding goodness in the DNA and isolating it <laughs> as, as a language of proteins, that would be very useful. Margaret Thatcher, who asked me to find the gene that, that caused people to abuse children. You just want the positive version of the same thing. Right. Anyway, uh, I, I, I want to put it forward. Uh, many people, growing people, start believing that we cannot reverse collapsing economies, we cannot reverse collapsing societies, we cannot reverse war, we cannot reverse climatic change, unless we go down to the very, very basic foundations of values which are shared by all people around the world, rich, poor, educated, not, ed not educated. And the more people we believe uh, are joining this um, optimistic fraternity, the more we can join our forces and the more we can contribute. So uh, for me, it's an invitation. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I'm having talked too much. But just thinking, thinking about the issue of civil war reminded me, I have friends um, like Professor Leif Renard at King's College London and others who talk about something called the resource curse. And we haven't talked about it because at the moment when we've talked, sorry? Hmm? Yes, well it does seem to me that perhaps then, I mean if, you under, if you're concerned with food security and you believe as I think perhaps we ought to believe that civil war is a major cause of the reasons why people starve and perhaps a major cause of um, various other problems. Maybe it is also we should talk about the resource curse, the curse of having desirable resources and not just as we've been talking at the moment, the curse of not having the blinking things because that does help to frame the problem in a slightly different way, perhaps returning us to some of the themes from yesterday.